Welcome to the Jay Kim Show, Hong Kong's very first podcast focused on entrepreneurship and investing in Asia. Join us as we survey the land and discover the greatest companies and most profitable investment opportunities in Asia. If this is your first time listening, thank you for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week with the goal of providing actionable insights to you, the listener, with every single episode. And now, on to the show. Today's show guest is Ryan Fullen. Ryan is a communications strategist who helps people convey their businesses and personal brands more effectively. Ryan has a unique 313 coaching system, which is a way to concisely articulate your value proposition of your brand or your business to anyone at any time in any situation. We go over a live example of this today on the podcast. I recently met Ryan in Shenzhen, actually. We were both speaking at a marketing conference, and his speech was so good and so articulate, and it blew me away, so I had to get him on the podcast. All right, let's get on to the show. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to the show, man. Ahoy, it is great to be here. I wish I was there with you in person because uh, that would be more fun, but this will have to do. Yeah, I know. We only had a brief uh, amount of time to spend when we were up in China together, Uh, but I was so blown away by your speech that I (laughs) I had to ask you to come on the podcast because the stuff that you, the value you provide is just unbelievable. So for the audience listening in, why don't you uh, give us a little introduction? Who's Ryan Follin? What do you do for a living, man? Sure. So what I do for a living is I solve probably the biggest problem that early stage entrepreneurs have. And what might that problem be? I'm glad that you asked. It is their (laughs) inability to communicate what they do or what their idea is in a very short amount of time. So you're talking about like something like the elevator pitch? I want to eliminate the elevator pitch. I want to uh, replace it with a conversation pitch or what I call permission-based pitching. Because as soon as you start to think that what you're doing is a pitch, you're looking at it all wrong. Because when you pitch, you talk at people and I believe the best way to communicate is to talk with them. So I'm being a little cheeky here. You know, you asked me what I do and I'm basically saying that I'm solving problems. But if you've noticed, now you're asking me what that is and we get into conversation. So just kind of leading in here by example, but if you want to think about what I do, what I get paid to do is to solve the problem that people have with ineffective communication. And you can think of me as the craftsman of communication. I work at a university and I help to solve the problems of about 25 plus units and departments on campus who are trying to communicate what they do to a large number of students amongst a lot of noise. Then outside of the university, I work with people to help them communicate who they are in the world with an extreme amount of noise. And that can be boiled down to the personal branding concept because If you are not focused on or aware of the importance of what other people think about you in this day and age, then you should start to get privy to it. And it's intimidating because we don't feel like we have control over Google. Like there's this, uh, there's this fear that no matter what I do, I still don't have control, but I want to give control back to people because the more effectively and the more consistently you communicate what you want to be known for, the more the world will see you as that, the more publications will write about that, the more content is created around that, therefore you ultimately can reverse engineer what's found online and help people understand in a quicker way what you want them to think about you. And that's exciting to me. Right, because you actually have some control. So before we get into to that, Ryan, let's let's take a little bit of a step back. How did you, you know, give us give us some give us some uh, some human background? Like where where did you where did you grow up? Where were you from? You know, how did you get into uh, this communication field? Sure, it, it all started back in the eighties, and when I grew up, I was convinced I was going to be an archaeologist, and I was very much uh, into Indiana Jones. That is until I realized how hot the desert really is and being a ginger of fair skin and red hair, like (laughs) I immediately turned (laughs) complete direction, though I thought it was cool. My early days as thinking I was going to be an archaeologist fell flat Uh, in high school and middle school. I was 
actually more so in middle school. Unfortunately, I was bullied pretty bad and isolated. And uh, that really led me to a solution, which was martial arts. And so martial arts was a huge part of my early life because the sooner I realized and had the mechanics of how to stand up for myself and even use my words as verbal judo, um, my life just got so much better. I found the right kind of friends and I started to excel. And in high school, ended up being uh, you know, senior class president, uh, was really active in the school community, did fun stuff like invented a car smash where I got two cars donated to campus and got sledgehammers and then charged a dollar per hit. And we raised all kinds of money by like by beating in cars so that that never happened nice. again. But I was able to get it in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> also created the Battle of the Sexes Week, which was a lot of fun. But again, after my presidency, that was not something that was allowed. So I've always been kind of <laughs> pushing envelopes. And I went to University of California, Santa Barbara. I was a gaucho. Got into a few mm. places, but really wanted to be by the beach. Grew up on Huntington Beach. Parents are educators. So if I'm not on land, there's a good chance I'm on the ocean and I'm sailing or I'm in the water or I'm at the beach. That's a huge part of me uh, and, and even my brand today is I'm a communicator and innovator and I'm a sailor. That's, that's what is the closest tie to being a human uh, for me is just nothing like being on water with no control over the wind but ultimate control over your sales. And I find that's an analogy I run with in life as well. And out of college, I accidentally discovered the theater. Like, really, I did not think it existed. I still don't really like musicals. But I got involved with a student group that were called the Sherwood Players at the time. And I accidentally went to an audition because I thought it was for extra credit. And I honestly had no idea what it was. I read a piece of paper. They laughed at me. I left. I'm pretty sure I shedded a little, a couple tears. I was very embarrassed. They called me back and said I got a part, and it was an adaptation of Sim City, which just recently came out in the movies, but this is way back before it was even thought about, and we turned comic books into a script, and I was Marv, because uh, I had this martial arts background. So here's this skinny 125-pound oh. kid that is doing all these uh, you know, crazy martial arts moves on stage. No, nobody had any seen anything like it, because they were all classically trained. So I'm like, let's do this. Here, let's get a bottle. Let's break this over somebody's head. Let's do a Van Damme kick. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun with that. And I uh, ended up acting, acting, producing, producing, directing, directing, and then took the whole crew over. And every quarter we put on uh, these crazy plays that were not musicals. <laughs> and uh, it actually created a lot of controversy. At one point, they shut us down. I applied to a different college on campus. I got accepted. I put on a show, got called into the office uh, like the big office slapped the newspaper because we were front cover and they're like, what are you doing? We said, you can't, you can't take us down because we're actually a website. We, then they tried to kick us out of school and we actually went to court and we had uh, probably oh. 150 people that were like protesting in support of us. And we won our case based on the fact that we were not a student group. We were a website. <laughs> and the school didn't have <laughs> jurisdiction around it. So the plays went on and we actually protested our next show even planted drugs on our own actors in line and created a big stink and had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> so I thought I would be like a great movie producer and film producer. So I went into Hollywood and I got uh, internships at ABC and Moo Productions. David E. Kelly was on all these sets. And the oh, very cool. the very common theme was slapped across the shoulder and going, well, we'll see you in 30 years, kid. We're, we're looking forward to your contribution. And that's kind of the mentality in Hollywood is that you've got to Unless you have nepotistic ties or yep. you have a lot of money, you basically have to work your way up. And I was like, there's no way I can work 30 years without having creative insight. So I left that industry and went to make a whole bunch of money in the mortgage industry. And I fell in love yeah. with sales and sold my way to the top. President's chairman, uh, drawing stick figures was actually a, a key way of how I made that happen. And that's a side story. But I made a whole bunch of money and then decided I could make more on my own and went and started my own brokerage firm. And then the market crashed. Perfect timing for me to learn a nice lesson of failure. And uh, that was pretty much you have to not dwell, but sort of run fast forward. And hmm. I mean, I was, uh, it, was a, it was a humbling time. I had a house that I lost, uh, had a car that I lost. I was working a construction job, swinging a hammer just to sort of make ends meet. And then it all got to a point where I actually filed for bankruptcy. And two weeks later, my application got returned unopened 
because I was 32 cents short on my postage. Oh man. So right there in front of the mailbox, I just, just, uh, it just ripped it up and worked my way through it. Literally hit that sort of proverbial rock bottom and, uh, worked back up into where I was financially secure and um, got into app development. And I was a COO of an app development company that was a startup and and we had a lot of success. And that got me on the map here in Orange County. And then I was uh, asked by UCI to come University of California, Irvine, to start their entrepreneurship program for undergrads. So that was exciting. And I was uh, on campus, boots on the ground, starting a startup at a major university And within the first two years, we crushed it. We had more traction than departments that have been around for 10 plus years, helped over 2,400 students start companies. And I got pulled into my boss's boss's office and I thought I was getting fired. For a good reason? Oh, well, I I honestly like, it was weird. And my boss at the time was like, okay, let's go right now. We're we're meeting with my boss. What do you mean? Just grab your stuff. Let's go. It's like, oh my God. (laughs) Like classic. So I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to get fired. Like I was doing all kinds of stuff, (laughs) making Snapchat ghosts, like six foot Snapchat ghosts. We're throwing paper airplanes off of the top of the student center. I got reprimanded a few times and classically did not ask for permission, but had to ask for a lot of forgiveness. So I'm there and the the guy, you know, they're saying, okay, well, Ryan, they look at each other. Do you want to start? No. Do you want to start? I'm like, okay, somebody just fired me already. And yeah. they're like, well, we, we see all the stuff that's happening on social media and all this stuff. And I'm like, I can explain. I can explain. And like, nope. <laughs> we really like what you're doing, Ryan. And uh, what we've done is we've created a new position in a vice provost's office. Well, we're not even sure what we're going to call it. But we want you to do whatever you've done for the Entrepreneurship Center and multiply it by 25 times. And I was nice. like, okay. So I've been running with that ever since. And part of, I think – any type of business is the output. And so I have successfully proven myself from an output standpoint so much that I implemented step-by-step directions from the one, the only Tim Ferriss in his four-hour work week. And I've negotiated a remote work agreement on campus. So I'm only there a few days a week, which allows me to hustle from home or from all over the world or China or wherever I may be uh, to explore and craft basically my ability to help people communicate more effectively because communication is something that you have to learn and learn and learn and learn and perfect. And I am so obsessed with learning. That's why I feel so good about teaching. Beautiful. Thanks for the introduction. That was awesome. (laughs) You you went really in in depth there, but you know, I, I, um, I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs and successful ones as particularly hit some sort of rock bottom point where it's, I think it's, it's, it's almost necessary. It's where failure is important for success. Um, no matter how, I mean, you learn a lot from failure, but it's the ones that at that point that kind of reach inside of themselves and can turn, turn the situation around that I, I always seem to, to feel like they, they end up doing a lot better, uh, in, in the long run. So while in the short term, it might be painful in the long run, it's worth it. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about communicating and, and, and what you were uh, talking about earlier and pitching ideas. And, um, you, you, you mentioned this in your speech, uh, up the marketing conference up in Shenzhen. When, uh, when we met, um, you, you had a, you had a few, uh, ideas, uh, one of them, which uh, is called the three one three method. What's yes, that all about? Yes, my my favorite thing. That that is what I want to be remembered for. That it, when, okay. when generations to come, they'll be they'll be working through the three one three, and they'll just take a slight moment. They'll be like, ah, oh, that guy Ryan must have been pretty crazy to come up with this thing. And then then they'll move on. But that's this is my magnum opus, and it okay, continues to go. get more yeah. exciting. The three one three stands for a method that will help. To, to hone in on the way you communicate your idea or your business or even yourself. And the, the first three is, stands for three sentences. And then the one stands for one sentence. And the three stands for three words. So in trying to address this problem I see, which is people having a very difficult time explaining what they do in a short amount of time. And if you've ever talked with an entrepreneur at an event or a conference or one-on-one or at the bar and you say, what do you do? They just get super excited and take a big deep breath and they go, oh my gosh, what do I do? <laughs> it just keeps going. 
And oftentimes you're more confused after they talk with you and then it gets awkward. Right. So solving that problem, I help people craft a three second communication pitch, a one second pitch and a three word pitch. I said, I think I said one second, but I meant one sentence and it's a very exciting um, technology because it's something that once people understand or are exposed to, there's nothing holding them back from trying it themselves. It's not like I'm teaching somebody to code C++ or S+, or whatever the heck it is. It's, it's, a, it's a methodology that when understood what the steps are, anybody can do it. And that's what's so amazing and powerful. I was recently in Haiti and giving them the presentation. And the feedback was so amazing because immediately after the workshop, they were able to use it. And they had a startup pitch competition. And the first three places, first, second, and third, all completely changed what they did to follow this 313 methodology. And uh, it's, it's exciting to see that go. So what it does is it's based on three principal pieces of information that you have to communicate to give the nuts and bolts of what you do. And that's the problem that you solve, your solution, and the market which you serve. Any business book is going to tell you that. But what makes this exciting and unique is that I put limitations on it. It's like the Twitter of pitching. I say you only get one sentence to tell me the problem. You can only tell me your solution in one sentence. And you can only tell me your market in one sentence. And though that may seem simple, or even just because the words single and one seem simplistic, it is so, so difficult. And that's what makes it so exciting. And the biggest principle of it is that I don't care what people do. And I really don't think anybody cares what anybody does. They really care about the problems that people solve. So that's right. I really, really, really care about what you do. If I have that problem and you see this a lot, there's certain people that are interested in certain types of services, but those services are self-serving for those customers. And when you can early on identify as in the first piece of information that you give to people, if you can identify the problem that you solve first, it helps them to know if they're interested and it helps you to know if they're interested. Because if you are giving an elevator pitch, you're not listening. And if you're giving uh, people more information and assuming that the product or service is for them, you're kind of disrespecting them. So it's based on this concept of permission-based pitching. And imagine for a moment next time you asked somebody what they did and they turned around and said, you know what, Jay, it's, this may sound funny, but it's not what I do. That's important. It's the problem that I solve. And then you are going to be like, well, what problem do you solve? And that person could then clearly define, I think it's one of the biggest problems that entrepreneurs who are in early stage trying to raise capital or trying to find founder, uh, you know, founding members, it's a problem that they have. Now, if you're a startup or you're interested at all, you're going to move one step closer and be like, Ryan, tell me, what what is this problem? Right. And so it's a way to get people interested in what you do without even telling them what you do. Because nobody cares what you do. They only care about the problem that you solve. And it's a really fun way to get people involved in that conversation. That's pretty interesting. You know what? It, it, it draws parallels in my mind to, um, and this might sound funny, but you know, like email marketing, when, you, when you're building an email list, okay. um, there's, there's, you basically want to hyper-target it. So a more responsive list is better. A smaller, more responsive list is far better than a large 10 million person list that no one reads, right? Yeah. Or no one picks yes, up. Yes. So when you're, when you're going down this email and if you're building a course or trying to sell something online or trying to send them to some sort of product, you actually don't care if they unsubscribe because they're, that person is a dead lead. He's never going to, he's never going to be ascended into whatever product you're trying to sell. So in my mind, it's kind of like the same thing. It's like if, if you're, you're basically targeting, you're, you're streamlining that, that process and making your conversation more effective because if the guy doesn't have that pain point that you can potentially solve, then he's not going to be tuned in to what you have to say anyway. So you don't even have to go into all that. Yeah, I love that analogy. Let's take it one step further because there's, there's an element here that um, I think we can stack on top of it. Or uh, I think you said ascend to. <laughs> I really like mm-hmm. that word, ascend, ascend to my products. <laughs> so in, a, in, in your example here, you have a marketing campaign. You have a million people that have somehow gotten on the list. 
and right. you're communicating this messaging to them. And based on that messaging, they'll sort of identify if it's right for them and they'll drop off and you're going to focus your attention on those that stay on. Mm -hmm. Parallel to the conversation, if you keep pitching or you keep communicating with somebody and they're right in front of you, they don't have the option to opt out, right? They can't, right. they can't put a spam stop on you or unsubscribe at the moment. Their eyeballs might be drifting. They're going to think about how they exit. They'll position their feet towards the doorway. Their body language will say <laughs> it, right? But people yeah. still don't pick up on that. But here's the thing. If you communicate with them in a way that they feel you're listening to them and you are taking responsibility for their interpretation, then it, it, it goes down this path I call binary sales. If I say, here's the problem that I'm solving. Sir, do you think it's a problem? Yes or no? Just in the world, they're mm. going to say yes or no. And that's like, you know, in an email form, you have send them something and you have them click on A button or B button and you learn a little bit more about them, right? To send them further yes. down the sequence. So they're going to click the button verbally that says, yes, that is a problem in the world. And you always ask if it's a problem in the world first because no one wants to admit that they have issues, but it's easier to admit that other people have the issues. So now the second level or this next email in this little live conversation, you would say, well, do you have that specific problem? Now they've already admitted that other people have it. So it's not as big of a deal. And they'll either say yes or no. If they say yes in the email identification funnel, you move them to the next stage and you ask them, well, are you looking to solve that problem? And it's either yes or no. Right. <laughs> and if they say yes, then you tell them, great, here's my service or I can help you out. No big deal. Yep. But let's go back to where you initially asked if they had the problem. If they say no, I don't have the problem. In an email, you lose them in that marketing campaign and they disappear. But in human interaction, if you're looking at somebody and you honestly say, you don't have that problem? Well, that's awesome. That's totally amazing and I'm so excited for you. Now you're done pitching with them, but you can say, do you know anyone that has that problem? Right. They know that you're not going to pressure them into a product that they don't need because they don't have that problem. But now you've gotten them to say, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I know some people. That's why they then would be interested in listening to what your solution is. And this is a way for you to not only quickly identify the person you're talking to, if you can help them, but gain their trust to potentially get a referral for you to help someone else that they know. And if you've ever been right. pitched at and people don't even realize, you're like, look, dude, you're talking to me about an iPhone app. I have an Android. Like It's right, not right. going to work for me. <laughs> and and there's, a, there's a great example. When people talk about their apps, I'll stop them and be like, can you tell me what platform this is on? Oh, it's on iOS. Well, I don't have an iOS phone. And right. then they just keep telling me about it. If it's slightly positioned like, oh, that's cool. Android's cool. Do you know anybody with iPhones? Yeah. Do they right. have that problem? Sure. So it's a way. I love your analogy of the email marketing, but you have this opportunity in person to gain their trust, keep you on the list as a referral partner. Yeah, totally, totally. So let's drill down into the three one three. So let's can we do a let's do an example of that. Okay. So uh, do you have a startup that you could pretend that you were in or or act on behalf of somebody else? Could you be the test pilot? Sure, I'll be the test pilot. Okay. Um, so don't don't tell me yeah. what you do. Okay. Because I remember okay. I don't care what you do. I only care about the problem you solve. So step one, tell me the problem you solve in one sentence without telling me what you do. Okay, I'm going to use my friend's startup okay. uh, as a, as an example. Um, I help investors. Stop! <laughs> I'm going to be. This is tough love here, Jay. You yeah, said yeah, no, no. I, you I said love it. you said I help people. That's not that's that's what you do. That's not the problem that you solve. So tell oh, me right, the right. problem without telling me what you do. Early stage investors have difficulty. With transparency in when making investment decisions. Okay. Now we could ask people, is that a problem or not? And most people I think would say yes. But here's another yes. side story question for you. Have you ever had a paper cut? Of course. Okay. And what happens with a paper cut? Pretend you just got one. Oh, 
What happens? What do you do? It's annoying. It's annoying. Ah. Yeah. You make a little noise and you hopefully nobody saw it and you probably don't even need a band-aid. You just kind of cover it with your thumb for a second, right? Right. What if you had a piece of paper that was so sharp and some weird crazy angle, you actually got a paper cut so severe, it chopped your finger off, cut right through your bone. Your finger is now on the floor squirting around and there's blood flying everywhere and everyone around starts screaming. What do you do at that point? <laughs> Scream for help. Right? And so somebody's going to call, what is it, 999 for you guys? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Somebody's going to get the finger. Somebody's going to put the finger on ice. Somebody's going <laughs> to calm you down. Somebody's going to put a tourniquet around your finger. Somebody's going to go get the car. Somebody's going to put you in the car. They're going to take you to the ambulance. Da, 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 da. Do you see the difference? The difference is that a finger being cut off is more severe. But there are actionable steps that happen after it happens. And when you're communicating... If you describe a problem that's like a paper cut, people are going to be like, meh, yeah, it's probably going to hurt a little bit, but dude, you don't even need a Band-Aid for that. Right, right. So in your friend's example here of what they, the problem, yeah, it's a problem, but you described it almost like, like a paper cut, right? Like it doesn't really sting. It doesn't make me feel like there's any immediate action. So if you okay, take so how that, about this? make it bloody. Yeah. Yeah, investors are losing millions of dollars in early stage companies due to lack of a transparency. Way better, right? And we could even we could even make it bloodier, right? Because what are the, what are those millions of dollars? It's really not only the millions of dollars, but their credibility and it's and it's their right. uh, ability to feed their families and keep their right. wives happy or their husbands happy. So you have these degrees that you can sort of notch it up, and if you're doing this on your own. Come up with your, your problem statement, share it with somebody, and ask them the following questions. Is this a problem or not? Yes or no? On a scale of 1 to 10, show me how many fingers, 10 being this is the worst problem ever and it has to be solved, or 1 is like, meh. Then you're going to ask them, and honestly, you, you say that to somebody the way you said it, and they'll be like, oh, it's kind of like at a 7 or an 8. And then you can ask them. Because psychologically, there's a couple things that are missing. You say, well, what are one or two things that could make it bloodier? And they'll be like, well, I know an investor that actually killed himself. Right. Ooh. And you'll be like, so we're solving the problem that investors not only lose millions of dollars, the reputation, but sometimes even their lives if they don't have the transparency they need when they're in the startup investing space. It's like, ooh, right? I mean, again, this is just showing you the example of these, the severity so let's say that now it's a problem and it's bloody. I think we're at like an eight, which is cool, but we want to eventually get it to a 10. So you're, right. there's your problem in one sentence. Now right. tell me the solution in one sentence. My platform provides all the transparency you need for early stage companies. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Now, the reason why people can't explain what they do in one sentence is because their instincts are to explain how they do what they do. And that becomes way more than one sentence. So what you right. did spot on, because my question is, does your solution solve the problem? And it's a very direct. Yes. You'd be surprised. People still have solutions that aren't completely hundred percent correlated with the problem that they solve. And that creates a disconnect when it comes to market product mm. fit. So you've got this solution. And the amazing part about saying your solution like that, if I am interested at all in this platform that helps create transparency for investors who deal with startups, what do you think I'm going to ask next? How does it work? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and as soon as I say, how does it work? You now have permission to go on. But I, right. I even tell people, when people give you permission, double down on it because if I ask you how it works, your question to me should be like, well, Ryan, tell me how much you know about investing in the startup space. And now I'll be like, well, not only have I invested, but I work with investors all the time and I hang out with them. And, and you're like, okay, cool, cool. So you know exactly how it all works. Let me just get down to the nitty gritty of why we're different than the next guy or why this is a unique platform. Imagine right. if you didn't ask me that question and you said, okay, so there's this thing called investment capital. And when I say startup, it means a company that, 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 that right? When right. you tell people things that they already know, it's a form of verbal disrespect. And so by asking them questions and qualifying what they know, 
you can now speak to them in terms that they respect you because they're like, wow, this guy just shortcut the whole conversation to just giving me the information that I actually wanted, right? Right. So you've got your problem in one sentence, your solution in one sentence. And I, I explain this through what I call the iceberg theory because what you do is the tip of the iceberg and how you do it, you do is under the water. Don't take people off of the boat and drag them underwater to see how you do what you do until they ask for it. So your third sentence in the three sentence pitch is going to be your market. So can you tell me the market that this problem is for or the market for the solution for the people who have the problem? The market as in the target client? Good, good question. So let me ask you the difference between your target market and your market potential. What are the differences between those two things? Okay, well, the, the, the target market are, is, is, uh, is quite wide. I mean, it could be anyone that is interested in early stage investing, right? I would say that I would almost say the opposite because your target, think like a target. It would be the, maybe the first hundred investors that would sign up for this platform that you actually could talk right. to or that's super, super narrow, right? I often right. try to get people to not use the A word or the E word. And the A word is anyone and the E word is everyone. Because right. as soon as you say, my product is for everyone, a sophisticated investor is going to say, <laughs> it's not for everyone, dude. And then they're sort of shut out and they know that you don't know as much as you think you do about your market. And a market right. potential is like globally and internationally. And like if this took off in a small marketplace, right? It's like Tinder started on a college campus to then explore to another college. And then now they're global, but they didn't start right. off global. So when you're describing your market, I feel people make a mistake of starting too wide. And mm -hmm. so in this 313 concept, the more specific you can be about what that customer looks like, the better it paints a picture in the person's head that you're talking to. Is that me or is that someone I know? Right. Okay. So, so the target, target market. So the target, the target market is, uh, is uh, angel investors that want to invest in Asian startups. Okay. And I like how you've got a location in there. We know that they're angel investors. And you could even go a little bit further if it's in Asian early stage startups, if that's what this really is, right? Sure. So yeah. the more specific you get with a target market, the better I can understand it. And there's a huge value in the takeaway. Because if you're talking to somebody and you say, well, you know, this isn't for everyone. Like if you're a VC, maybe not my game. If you're a traditional investor, not my game. As soon as you say this is not for everyone, people start to get interested because no one wants to be left out. Mm. So you've got your three sentence pitch here, right? So the next time that your friend is talking with someone and they have an opportunity to converse, they can use those three sentences as the cornerstone of communicating what they do. Oh, I like it. Now, yeah. to take it one step further, if you want to know how to do that all in one sentence, it's simply mathematics. The hard part is developing the three sentences. So I don't know, what, are you in front of your computer? Do you have three items in front of you? Name three random items that you can touch right now. My podcasting mic. Okay. My laptop. Okay. And my desk lamp. Okay, cool. And I have a, a, a USB drive, a little tether for a cord and a post-it note. So we're, we have these different things. Okay. How many different ways can you arrange those on your desk? I'm not going to make you do it because we'll probably lose connection and your and the lights will go out. But <laughs> but if you were to rearrange these three things in a certain order, how many different ways could you arrange those three things? Well, it's uh, it's it's like math, right? Yes. It's, um, it's if, so. Yeah. The hint is it's, it's like three, three factor three, two, one. three, three, yeah. three factorial. Is yeah, the, yeah, that's right. So three with an exclamation point. So the shortcut is three times two times one. The mathematics say six. But after the call, if you don't believe me, you can arrange your microphone and your lamp and your <laughs> laptop six different ways. That's it, right? So, I believe you. <laughs> so let's imagine that your your uh, the podcast microphone represents the problem and the laptop represents the solution. 
and the lamp represents the market. The same math holds up. You can arrange those three elements six different ways. And if you truly are only communicating one problem, which you did, and you're communicating the what you do, not how you do what you do, and then you're communicating this really specific visual on who this is for, your market, you can combine those elements in one sentence six different ways. For the people with this problem, I have this solution, and here's who it's for. Or put the laptop in front, and it says, I, do, I have this type of a platform to solve this problem for these people. And it's a really powerful thing because, again, you'd never want to seem memorized or you never want to seem rehearsed. And oftentimes if we're in networking situations or at conferences and you have multiple people that you're talking with in groups, if a new person came up to that circle and there's always that like, oh, w- w- what do you guys do, right? And then it's like everybody looks around and gets scared because nobody has a half an hour for everybody to give their 10-minute spiel again. You can right. say, well, for – Early stage investors who are afraid of the real problem of transparency, we've got a solution that's in a uh, an app format or or however it's delivered. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You just explained everything within one sentence, and five more people could walk up to that group, and you could say it differently each time. And that, to me, is authentic. That's organic, and it and it communicates those core nuggets for then people to understand if it's a problem that they have or a problem that someone that they know has and then be interested to ask how you do what you do and then to challenge you on your market or help them see if they know someone who you could connect them with. That's the middle part. Love it. So that's one sentence, right? Now, the final is where it gets really exciting because it's breaking things down into relational terms. Now, getting it into three words is the magic swing zone. That's the strike zone. If it happens to be more words, it's not a big deal. The concept is that it's actually relating two different things. One word is one thing. The second word is a relational term. And the third, the third word is technically this other thing. We have mental mind maps that we are created during the process of learning linguistics. And you see a fan and you think fan and you know what a fan does and you have a fan and then you like the fan that has a cold and you have these like all these neurons actually create these little trails that connect the dots in your brain. And we learn language based on relative things. Ryan, that's a dog because it's not a cat. Ryan, it's three o'clock because it's not four o'clock. Things are really in just position. So we are these crazy Uh, you know, marketeers in our own mind, because we're always trying to make sense of the world in terms of other things. And that's the power of this three words. So if I say, think of me as the blacksmith of branding, you know what a blacksmith is, you probably thought of like the last time that you either were at Knott's Berry Farm and or maybe you were like, think of a horse and a horseshoe, like however crazy your memory goes. You know that it's a lot of work and it's a lot of pounding and it's a lot of heat and retrying and refining, 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 refining until you get this amazing, beautiful medieval sword. Right. And I can tap into that mental map by saying, think of me as like a blacksmith, but when it comes to giving talks. Now, it might not make sense at first, but your brain tries to find the connection. And the most powerful thing you can do is get someone else to think of what you do before you even tell them. And so I'm technically not telling you if I say I'm the blacksmith of branding, that kind of doesn't make sense, but you're going to be like, wait a minute. Okay. Um, so you like help people build their brands. (laughs) Yes. You're so smart. And now they're engaged. I don't know if you've ever been in a group activity and you suggest like, Oh, we should do this with this slide or let's use this picture. If you get that one that's chosen in a group, you're like proud of it. You're like, that was my picture. I chose that cover yeah, image. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you're giving people the, the ability to do this. So let's let's think of this for your for your buddy. Let's think of right. terms that has nothing to do with investing, but really it's almost like a transparency, right? So uh, do you have contacts or is there anything like transparency with – I'm trying to think like um, anti-fog. Like anti-fog mm. 
uh, think of my company as kind of like an anti-fog for uh, investments. <laughs> right. And so it doesn't make sense, right? You're just coming up with this. But you think like visually fog, you're clearing the mirror on the fog. And then you start to say, well, the problem is that transparency when it comes to startups, people lose millions of dollars in their credibility and they're thinking in their head. Hmm. Okay. Wait, uh, yeah. And you say, so we have this platform and they literally could stop you and go, wait a minute. Is it some sort of technology that lets there be more visibility when you're investing in the startups? And you're like, yes. Oh, my Boom. gosh. You are so smart. How are you so smart? Right. And so they get all excited yeah. and, and then they get that. And you can say, well, really, here's what we do. And then they ask, well, how do you do it? Well, hold on. It's not for everyone. It's just for these people. So I, unfortunately, I couldn't even give you access to it. But maybe you know somebody who I could help out. And that's, that's the kind of magic of how that works, right? So it could be for business. It could be for your brand. I mean, we could even do it for your podcast, right? Right. So imagine if somebody's like, you go up to them, you're like, oh, dude, you got to check out my podcast, right? And they're like, all right, well, what's it about? And you looked at them and said, it's solving the biggest problem that you have. <laughs> they're going to be like, what? You're like, yeah, the problem I solve. Now, this radio show might not be for everyone, right? I'm solving the problem blank. <laughs> and right. your solution is a podcast that delivers experts who help to solve that problem collectively. And then your market is you take it away and you say it's only for these core people that are at this stage or that are really interested or people that are actually the type of people that listen to information and take action. Because the last thing I want is somebody who's not active in my community because we're building uh, not an email list of a million, but an email list of a thousand people who are really, really into solving their problem. Right. So it's exciting. So I, I mean, I, I, I think that each time I talk about it, I get a little bit more excited. <laughs> but Dude, it was awesome. Yeah, I, I, I really think that every, every person, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're even just a, you know, whatever, whatever you do, whatever your occupation is, you should ha kind of have this down pat because it's a great it's really great for social interaction as well like any sort of party that you go to or mingle or meet up you know i mean this these are all uh, very effective ways of communicating uh who you are yeah and here, here's another little fun snippet of some of my communication theory jay have you ever jumped out of an airplane never okay when you do i'm just assuming from power positive here that you that you will experience this and i haven't but i, I will at some point <laughs> Would you rather have a circular parachute or would you rather have one that's rectangular? Uh, I have no idea, but I'm guessing the circular one. Okay, cool. So congratulations. You've jumped out of a plane and now you have no control of where you land. You could land on a tree. You could land in a, <laughs> in a, cow, you know, in a cow field. You could be like, uh, unfortunately, World War II and get caught up on like a, a fiery electric pole or something like that, right? So here's, right. here's the thing. Elvis, or somebody dressed like Elvis, can have smoke coming out of his heels and with a rectangular parachute land right on the 50-yard line right at the right time, right? right? And the difference between a circular parachute and a rectangular is control, <laughs> is your ability to control where you're going. So I think that, like, I take visualize the words that you're going to say. So let's say an, a networking meeting and let's say that you have a friend who is a financial writer right like it doesn't get any less sexy than that right i'm a financial <laughs> writer so imagine a financial writer like you you're attached i'm actually a financial writer as well by the way <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's super sexy i mean it's super, but but the thing is that when you have those words attached to string that is attached to a circular parachute imagine that traveling in through someone's ear uh, like Honey, I Shrunk the Kid style. And like, you have no idea where it's going to land in someone's brain. They may have had a bad experience with finance and anything having to do with the word finance, they just shut it down. Uh, right. They may have this preconceived notion of a writer that you're a boring person. And the way that we choose words is a way that we sort of float them into someone's head. And if you use yeah. what is already in someone's head and you're really specific and getting people like creatively involved in the process, then you can literally steer uh, your words directly into their brain where you want and it can resonate in a way that is more exciting and creates intrigue. 
I love it. I love it. Dude, Ryan, <laughs> thanks for walking me through the the method. I definitely need uh, to work on it myself. Um, and I think the audience, uh, anyone listening in, tuning in right now to the show, I, I encourage you guys to go and, and do this exercise on your own. You know, write it out on a piece of paper or, or rehearse it with someone. And, I, I, and I, I'm going to do it And myself. here's the thing, too. I challenge you to, to tweet it to me. And just use the, the hashtag 313 method. And then in one tweet, explain your problem. And I'll beat you up on it. And we can actually create a poll around it where do people think it's a really big problem or not so big of a problem? And then tweet me your solution in one sentence and tweet me your market in one sentence. And it's fun for everybody to sort of learn together. But this is a very much an active kind of communication theory where you need to get input from other people. And even on a public platform, it's very fun because people will chirp in and honestly give you feedback on how it lands where in their brain. That's awesome. That's uh, thanks for offering that. You, you guys listening in, and guys and gals, uh, free coaching. Yes. On Twitter <laughs> from the Ginger MC himself. <laughs> yes. Um, Ryan, what a as we're looking to wrap up, what what exciting things are you working on right now uh, that you want to draw the audience's att- attention to? Yeah. So with with my company Influence Tree, InfluenceTree dot com. If you forget it, think about growing your influence like a tree. Right? Yeah, now you have this burned image nice. instead of a URL in your mind. And right. we have our core personal branding course. And we have a really exciting new program that's coming out called Future Experts. Because we've had people in high school reach out to us. They're like, I'm not an expert yet, but I want to start building my brand. And so there's a right. different way of positioning yourself as you're building your brand without being an expert. And we've brought on 10 uh, young millennials and or Gen Zs who are successfully building their brand helping us to teach the lesson. So that's come out, which we're excited about. And then we have a course called, well, we haven't come up with a title yet, but it's about helping people get on the TEDx stage. Because speaking oh, on man. TEDx, at TEDx, in TEDx, is the quickest way to get massive credibility for you and your brand because it's about ideas we're spreading. And uh, I've landed two TEDx talks. I've coached a bunch of TEDx uh, speakers. I'm involved with a whole bunch of them uh, from just different capacities. And i believe that I've cracked the code of helping people figure out how to get up there. And so it's a 12 step course. <laughs> that, kind of, that sounds bad, but it, there are 12 lessons. <laughs> There's 12 lessons and we step everybody through that entire process. So we're going to launch that soon. And then I have a strategic pitching and, and networking class, which talks about the 313. So the most exciting thing I have is taking this content that we develop and putting it on a platform to where people from around the world can leverage it without leveraging my time because it's my time is very expensive. I like to say it's like throw up in your mouth expensive. So uh, we're, <laughs> we're creating these opportunities to, cause I'm really passionate about getting the information out there. Cause I really believe that the, the one way you can upgrade your life is by mastering communication from a personal level to a business level to just even speaking with kids. Like no matter what you do, we're communicating all day long. So we're creating these courses around it and that's exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so Ryan is uh, partners with uh, Leonard Kim, who's also on my show previously as a guest. And um, yeah, that's awesome. So Ryan, what's the best place that people can find you, follow you, connect with you, and learn a little bit more about the Ginger MC himself? <laughs> if you want to learn about me, go to ryanfoland.com. And that's R-Y-A-N-F-O-L-A-N-D. My last name is just like Poland, but imagine erasing the middle of the P. So it's an F, <laughs> L-A-N-D, right? Nice. <laughs> and, you, you know, again, communication, right? I'm like drawing these images in your brain. So you're like, who is that guy? It was it like Poland, but er, got it. So learn yeah. more about me at Ryan Foland. Uh, if you want to connect with me, Twitter is my platform. That's at Ryan Foland. If you want a stick figure drawing every day, you can follow me on Instagram. And that's Ryan.Foland. Think of the dot as a Sharpie marker because every day I do Sharpie marker stick figure drawings, which is fun. And then if you want to have access to, uh, you know, these training courses, you go to influencetree.com. Awesome. Yeah. And by the way, just a side, a quick side note. What is, what's up with the stick figures and Instagram? Well, I believe that you should be on social media platforms for a reason. And personally, I don't have a reason to be on Facebook. I I don't, I don't want to be on Facebook because for me, just it sucks up my time and I don't like it. And I still post, but I'm not really there. 
Twitter, mm-hmm. I love to to share my tips, and it's all about keeping it simple and short. And I all my articles, and I share, and I love that as a platform. And Instagram, I needed to figure out why I would be on Instagram. Like, sure, I have fun and stuff, but like, I don't have a purpose of you know posting selfies and like what I'm doing. But I found my purpose challenged by the one and only Tony Robbins. I was at one of his events and. Nice. Uh, basically he said, look, you need to make a big goal. And that was my three, one, three book, which I've written. And then he said, you need to make a small goal. I'm like, well, I'm not sure what that is. And after some exploring and digging down, I'm like, well, I draw stick figures. It's like, well, why can't you draw a stick figure a day? Could you make that commitment? Yes. All right. So I made that commitment and I'm almost two years into it. And every single day I draw a stick figure and I started to use quotes of other famous people and I ran out of them. <laughs> like I couldn't find short quotes and so I just started to make them up my own. And then so I go throughout my day and I'm, I'm thinking in this quote mentality. And right. uh, just it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun and it gives me structure and it, and it has a lot of value that I'm able to provide on that platform. I challenge everyone to have a mission statement for your social media platforms. Because if you don't know why you're on social media, at least that platform, then you might need to really think about why you're on there. And then yeah, it, that totally. all comes with the communication part of things, right? Control what you communicate, but you got to decide first what you want to communicate. Hundred percent. So awesome, man! Uh, such a pleasure having you on, Ryan Fulham, the hashtag Ginger MC. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing your knowledge. And I think that all of us, after we get off listening to this, we're gonna go run and, and take care of our. Uh, mission statements and our our, uh, 313 exercise. So thanks again, man. Appreciate your time. All right, buddy. You too. We'll see you soon. All right. Yep. Take care. Bye. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. All the show notes and links can be found over at jkimshow.com. Come back often and make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of The J. Kim Show. I'd love to hear your comments. You can find me on Twitter at jkimmer, J-A-Y-K-I-M-M-E-R. See you guys next week. This podcast is brought to you by Hack Your Fitness, the high achiever's guide to getting ripped in under three hours a week. If you're anything like me, you're probably working a full-time job or jobs and trying to find time to balance family life, social life, and last but not least, fitness. Look, I get it. I'm a full-time investor and entrepreneur myself and father of two. So how am I able to stay fit year-round without spending hours and hours in the gym killing myself on the cardio machine? After struggling for the last 15 years trying every workout and diet under the sun, I finally designed a system that allows me to achieve and maintain single-digit body fat for life in under 3 hours a week. Cardio not required. Head on over to hackyour.fitness and download my free 13-page guide that teaches you the simple science behind efficient fitness and smart nutrition and gives you everything you need to know to finally take control of your life. That's hackyour.fitness. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs>